In this podcast, we will be talking about the wave-particle duality of light. We will identify wave-like properties of light, identify particle-like properties of light, explain the double slit experiment, and conceptually explain the photoelectric effect. We'll be saving an example of problems from the photoelectric effect for the next video. Throughout human history, there have been debates about the exact nature of light. As far back as 400 BC, people were debating about whether it was a wave or a particle. And as each step in history occurred and more scientific knowledge was developed, the debate raged on. There are many more players in this game than what are listed here, and the history of how each philosopher or scientist defended his point of view is fascinating, but I'll refer you to the internet or out-of-class history reading if you happen to be interested in these. Once Einstein came along, he solved the debate, for at least what appears at the moment, to look like for good, and says that it has both wave and particle-like properties, and therefore is either or both, depending on how you want to think about it. Here we'll talk about the two most famous experiments that establish both wave and particle-like properties. First, we'll look at Robert Hooke's experiment, which showed that light has wave-like properties. Before watching this, it is extremely important that you understand wave interference, so please be sure that you review the earlier podcast on the topic, or of course the book if you prefer. I would also like to suggest watching the video link for the Dr. Quantum link above. They do a wonderfully entertaining job of describing the double slit experiment with animations, and I would suggest watching this before continuing. Here we have a diagram of what the Dr. Quantum video showed us. We can see that there's a single slit with a light source above, and how the waves spread off out across the space. We can then see how they come through the two slits, and how each set of waves interact. The line along the bottom here shows you what you would see if you were doing this in a laboratory. Wherever the waves interfere destructively, you have a dark patch. Wherever the waves interfere constructively, you have light patches. These are called interference patterns, and you can even calculate information like how far apart the slits are based on how far apart the lines in the interference pattern is. These would not happen if light only had particle-like properties, as particles don't interfere with each other. What Young's initial experiment doesn't show us is the idea that it also has particle-like properties. Einstein devised an experiment that showed that light has both wave and particle-like properties all in one experiment which showed that there is a wave-particle duality with light, and that it can have properties of both. The photoelectric effect is what Einstein won his Nobel Prize for. Since he is so well known for his theory of relativity, often people think that that was what it came from, but it wasn't. Now, what is the photoelectric effect? When we shine light onto a metal surface, if it is of sufficient energy, electrons will be ejected. However, this will require that the incoming light has enough energy to eject the electron, and furthermore, it cannot be the combined energy of light between multiple photons, but the energy of one photon. Let's take a quick example to illustrate this. If we have potassium metal and we shine different energy of light on it, we will get drastically different results. Violet light, which has a higher energy and frequency than red light, will eject electrons However, no amount of red light can do this. Even if we shined the brightest red light possible on the metal, no electrons would be ejected. Conversely, we can only shine a tiny bit of violet light and still get ejected electrons. Keep in mind, as we are discussing this experiment, the difference between energy and intensity. When we are talking about energy, we are talking about the energy of a photon. But when but we can increase or decrease the intensity as well. If we think about what an intense light is, we mean a bright light. In more scientific terms, that means a light with lots of photons being emitted. If we are in the visible region, we can think of intensity as brightness, and energy or frequency as being the color of light. So how can we figure out what energy needs to be used to eject the electrons? Well, each metal will have a specific work function, or amount of energy it takes to eject the electrons. This tells you what energy you need. If you know this work function, you know the threshold energy. To find the threshold frequency, you use the E equals H nu equation that we discussed a few podcasts ago. Now I want you to do a little activity before getting too much further into this. This activity will help you visualize a lot of what I said in the last slide. 
First, you're going to pause this video and spend some time playing with it on your own. This will help familiarize yourself with the system and learn some things through exploration rather than just by me stating it. It's very important that you do this step that is simply you playing around with it rather than trying to do exactly what I tell you to, or you won't get quite as much out of it. So pause the recording now and go do this. Come back when you feel you've figured out that, that all there is to figure out, and I'll give you some specific questions to work on answering. Now I want you to answer some questions using the simulation. Listen to all the questions and then pause the recording, answer them for yourself by exploring the simulation, and then we'll work on it together. You can get this list from the PowerPoint document as well if it's simpler than pausing the video and trying to flip back and forth to a video screen. Now let's step through this. I ask about sodium, so we'll check and make sure that the sodium metal is checked, and it is. From here, I ask, what is the lowest wavelength that will eject electrons from sodium? If we start with a low wavelength, can do this. Now we'll turn up the intensity so that we can actually see something happening. We see nothing's happening right now, which means that we don't have enough energy. So we'll slowly start moving up the slider. And then right around here, we get some ejected electrons. So right around about the 500-ish mark. This is more about getting the concepts down than um, specific numbers, so don't stress too much about getting the exact number. Now, when I say what frequency does that relate to, I don't actually so much mean numbers, although we could definitely calculate that. We could just use our equations to switch between wavelength and frequency. But what I was actually looking for is to say, okay, well, that's called the threshold frequency. The first, the lowest frequency that will eject electrons. So what do we call this frequency? Well, we call it the threshold frequency. Okay, so now let's l leave the wavelength slider on that wavelength and see what happens if we change the target metal to zinc. If we change this to zinc, we notice everything stops. That means that zinc has a th higher threshold frequency, that in order to get more electrons in order to get electrons to be ejected, we need to increase the frequency again. So we move it up into the UV and it starts to eject electrons again. Now, what happens if we increase or decrease the intensity slider? Well, if we increase intensity, we're putting more photons of light and for every one photon of light, we get a fot we get an ejected electron. And so more, eject more electrons will be ejected. Now, let's go back and do sodium. Move this back down. Move our intensity back down. All right, so we'll start from here again, since it's a little bit easier to see. So we raise our intensity. and we get more electrons. They're coming off more often. Now, what happens if, starting from sodium here, we increase or decrease the frequency? Let's move this back down. Now, let's increase the frequency slider and see what happens. You'll notice the ejected electrons come off way faster. They come off with a higher velocity. And that's because all of that extra energy is being transferred into the electrons. Let's look at each of those questions again, or forms of those questions again, without the simulation to help. What happens if the intensity of light is increased? Let's remember what intensity translates to in words about how we perceive it. We perceive a greater number of photons as brighter, since more photons are hitting our eyes. So in order to get it brighter or more intense, you would need to have more photons. Now, more photons will eject more electrons, because each photon can only eject a single electron. So if you are, and that of course is only if you are above the threshold frequency.
If you're below the threshold frequency, no intensity will be no intensity of light will ever eject an electron. Let's look at the issue of increasing frequency now. We saw in the simulation that ejected electrons speed up. The velocity is increased. So as long as you are above the threshold frequency, increasing the frequency increases the velocity of the ejected electrons. If you are below the threshold frequency, nothing will happen until the threshold frequency is met and then the velocity will start to increase. We can do some calculations with this information as well, finding the speed of the ejected electrons by using frequency or wavelength and vice versa, or finding the work function if we know both the frequency and the speed of the electrons, and we'll do these in later videos. Let's look at this equation one more time and see what else we can do with it. Since the work function is a constant, as well as h, we only have two variables and they're related in a linear fashion. We can look at this as y equals mx plus b. Here's a graph from the Atkins book that shows this. You can see here that h is the slope. Because we are dealing with a physical phenomena that doesn't occur until a threshold is met, the graph just reads zero until we reach the threshold frequency, at which point we then get a linear relationship between the frequency and the kinetic energy. Example problems for doing the calculations are going to be shown in the next video, since otherwise this one will get a little bit long. Let's summarize what we learned today in this very dense podcast. We started out by talking about the large amounts of controversy throughout history about what, what light really was. And then we discussed the two experiments that solved this by showing that the wave particle duality of light, or in other words, that light has both the characteristics of a wave and a particle. This is true of very small matter. And in the future podcast, we'll discuss wave particle duality of other matter as well, um, and why only very small things exhibit it in a way that we can see. So we talked about the photoelectric effect, showing both particle and wave-like properties. We talked about the double split experiment, which showed wave-like properties. We learned that this is true of very small matter. And as an extra little tidbit for you, I thought I'd mention that the largest so far that we've been able to measure wave-like properties in is those with a mass of 1610 AMU, so a molecular mass of 1610. So that is your interesting factoid for the summary slide. After watching this video and doing a bit of extra studying on it, you should be able to identify wave and particle-like properties of light and explain the two experiments that showed those. You should also be able to conceptually explain both the double slit experiment and the photoelectric effect. And after watching the next video, we'll get to example problems using the photoelectric effect as well.